So the speaker today is Norbert Bodendorfer. And he's going to talk about symmetry reductions in loop quantum gravity based on classical gauge physics. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for the introduction and for the possibility to give this uh, seminar here on the International Loop Quantum Gravity Seminar. So uh, today I'm going to report about some work that we have been doing recently here in Warsaw, uh, essentially over the course of the last one or two years, and uh, this is a, a work in collaboration with Jurek Lewandowski, Janek Czyzewski and Antonia Zipfel. So let us start on slide uh, number two now, uh, where we will give uh, a brief uh, outline of the talk in a nutshell. So the aim uh, of our talk today, or the aim of the research that we're doing here, is to symmetry reduce in loop quantum gravity, and we want to symmetry reduce at the quantum level. So we do not start classically, symmetry reduce and then quantize, but we first quantize and then symmetry reduce. And then the aim will of course be to extract the dynamics of the symmetry reduce sector by uh, looking at the full theory dynamics and how it acts in this symmetry reduced space. So the results that were obtained so far are the following. Uh, we can reduce to loop quantum cosmology. Uh, there are two ways to do this, essentially two different sets of variables, so two different sets of full theory variables, later resulting in two different sets of reduced variables. It's possible to reduce to a Bianchi 1 model, and it's also possible to reduce to a spatially flat Friedman-Robertson-Walker model. So here in this talk, we will sketch uh, both of those uh, possibilities, uh, starting with uh, the second one, because it is kind of easier and it will serve as an outline of the framework. Then you can also reduce to spherical symmetry. Uh, this has originally been done in a certain type of SU2 variables that we will talk about later. So these variables, they would be very close to the Ashtika-Babero variables that we use in the full theory. However, just very close, they are not exactly the same. Since they are uh, SU2 variables, in particular non-abelian, the uh, gauge group is non-abelian, uh, things will be more complicated there and uh, extracting the dynamics there works only partially and in a paper from last week we have made some progress in, in, in extracting some commutator relations at least at a qualitative uh, level with Antonia Zipfel. And then there you can also use uh, different variables, kind of abelian connections, which make things easier. However, I will not talk about that uh, today due to time reasons and it's kind of rather similar to this reduction to loop quantum cosmology, uh, so we will just skip that part. So what else? I mean, why else would you be interested in this talk or this line of research if you're not really interested in symmetry reductions? Well, this line of research, it offers you some or a simplified setting where you can study full theory dynamics and in particular coarse graining. So in many of these applications, we will encounter that we can uh, use abelian gauge groups, which means that uh, the usual problems that we have in quantum gravity, for example, non-commuting fluxes, they are not uh, present here and you can really compute the dynamics exactly and you can uh, then work uh, easier. And also that also, of course, simplifies coarse graining because coarse graining is kind of the study of uh, dynamics under the change of scale. Okay, so with this talk in a nutshell, let's then proceed to the next slide, slide number three, where we briefly outline uh, what we're going to do in this talk today. So in the first section, we will start with a general strategy of how we want to attack this uh, symmetry reduction problem. So what are the steps that we're doing starting at the classical level until uh, extracting the reduced dynamics? Then the main part of the talk will be in sections two to four, where we'll give uh, three examples of such symmetry reductions. The first one will be an example of the formalism where we will study how to get a spatially flat Friedman robertson walker a loop quantum cosmology. Uh, in particular in variables which are the so-called VB variables, where V is the volume of the universe and uh, B is its uh, conjugate momentum. In section 3 we will study how to derive a Bianchi 1 model from a full theory. There we will make uh, an interesting observation which is that you need to import the mu bar scheme from loop quantum cosmology also in the full theory if you want to extract the dynamics successfully using very coarse states, which is what we're going to do here. After this, we will switch gears and look at spherical symmetry. There we will use uh, these SU2 variables and we will see how far you can get there uh, uh, with uh, trying to extract the quantum dynamics. Okay, so let us start then with the strategy which uh, is on slide number five. So the strategy for uh, this uh, research program is the following. You first of all start classically and you try to find a very suitable classical starting point. Uh, this will first uh, be that you gauge fix the spatial diffeomorphism constraint. 
so by this gauge fixing or by doing different gauge fixings, uh, you kind of push the theory into some form where you might handle easier certain problems. And this will uh, in particular be the case here. We will then also choose some connection variables because we will always use loop quantum gravity methods to quantize here. And uh, yeah, that will be done in this point number one. The second point is then that we identify certain uh, phase-based functions, which we call reduction constraints. So this is done at the classical level, but at the classical level, we will only identify those functions. And what we're doing is the following. We're looking at the symmetry-reduced sector of phase space, and there we just look at some functions which vanish in this symmetry-reduced sector. So these functions we call fi, and we denote them as reduction constraints. However, at the classical level, we do not impose any symmetry. We just like, find these functions which vanish. We will then quantize uh, using our standard loop quantum gravity methods, in particular the Hilbert space, the Ashika Lewandowski measure, uh, the construction of diffeomorphism invariant states, the construction of dynamics, uh, and so forth. This will still be a kind of full GR, which uh, full GR a gauge. So it's a little restricted because uh, in a certain gauge, not all solutions are accessible. However, it's in principle still full GR that we quantize. In the fourth point, then, we will impose the reduction. So we will take these functions f from the classical level, we will quantize them, and we will define symmetric states as states which are in the kernel of these operators, f i hat. And we will define symmetric operators as operators which commute with f. So by this definition, these symmetric operators, of course, preserve the symmetric subspace. And then we will extract the dynamics of these symmetric operators by looking at the full theory dynamics. And in the end, of course, you want to compare this then with what people have found in loop quantum cosmology or in spherically symmetric approaches to quantum gravity. So therefore, if you look at the cartoon on the right, our strategy is to already at the classical level choose uh, this starting point, which is kind of distinct from the usual quantization that we do, so distinct from quantizing uh, all the constraints and solving them at the classical level. And by this, I mean, this will really pay off in point four when we impose the reduction constraints, because that will be very easy and it will allow you to extract the dynamics in the end. Okay. So let us see how this works in detail now. So we now go to the next slide, uh, which is slide number seven, where we start with the, uh, this example of the formalism. So as said, we uh, first start with a kind of standard general relativity. We start with the ADM phase space. It is coordinatized by the spatial metric Q. It has its conjugate momentum P, and they are they just have their standard canonical brackets. Now, in this phase space, uh, what you do is you impose the diagonal metric gauge. So you impose that your metric Q is just a diagonal metric, and we call its uh, diagonal entries QXX, QYY, and QZZ. So this condition gauge fixes the spatial diffeomorphism constraint, which we here call CA equal to zero. And what we then have to do, and according to the standard procedure of how such a gauge fixing, fixing is done, we take CA equal to zero, and from it we extract an expression for the off-diagonal components of P in terms of the diagonal components of Q and P. So what we do is we solve the spatial diffeomorphism constraint, and by this we find some expression of P A not B in terms of the reduced variables. And the reduced variables on this gauge fixed phase space, they are just the diagonal components of the metric and the diagonal components of the momentum P, and they retain their canonical bracket. Now, if you look at the picture uh, on the right, you see kind of the, the usual picture that people draw. So this box corresponds to phase space. On phase space, we have the uh, this constraint surface, the red one, where the spatial diffeomorphism constraint vanishes. This is kind of the constraint surface of the ADM phase space, neglecting the Hamiltonian constraint for now. And this uh, constraint surface is cut by the blue surface, which is uh, saying you that the metric is uh, diagonal. And what you're doing in this gauge fixing, you're working on the cut between these two surfaces. You're working on the cut between the blue and the red surface. On this, you have your reduced variables, which are the diagonal components of the metric and the momentum. So I will try to skip uh, any more technical details about these gauge fixings and so forth in this talk, because they're not really important for uh, what we want to achieve and uh, what we want to say today. So let us continue then uh, to the next slide, slide number eight. So as we have said before, we uh, want to choose some adapted variables for our problem at the classical level. Now these diagonal components of the metric, they do not turn out to be very, uh, very useful for the task that we have in mind. However, we're just going to change variables now. 
and we're going to do that, of course, uh, uh, with having in mind what we want to achieve later on. So if you look at the first line on the slide, we're defining a pair of variables alpha and p alpha in the following way. We define alpha to be uh, just uh, the volume density, so the square root of the determinant of the spatial metric, and then we define p alpha to be roughly the trace of the extrinsic curvature. And what you find then is that alpha and p alpha, they are canonically conjugate. Now alpha and p alpha are very useful in this context because we can easily extract variables that we use in loop quantum cosmology from them. So if you look at the right, we can extract what people call v, the volume of the universe, by just integrating alpha over the spatial slice sigma, and we can extract b uh, by just having it proportional to p alpha. So there's just some numerical prefactor between b and p alpha. If you look at how p alpha is constructed, it is a scalar geometrically, so uh, this makes sense to have p alpha uh, the same everywhere. Now, you need two more uh, pairs of variables, and these are these pairs beta and gamma in the second and third line, they are constructed in such a way that they measure the deviation from friedman robertson walker So if you look at p-beta, then p-beta is the logarithm of qyy over qxx. Now in the spatially flat friedman robertson walker the metric is just the unit uh, matrix times some scale factor, therefore its diagonal entries are the same, and therefore qyy over qxx is just one, therefore p-beta vanishes. The same is true, of course, for p-gamma, and similarly, also beta and gamma vanish because also the momenta are conjugate to the metric have the same diagonal entries. And then if you compute all Poisson brackets, you find that alpha p alpha, beta p beta, and gamma p gamma, they are canonical pairs, and all other Poisson brackets vanish. Of course, you also extract now the Poisson brackets of B and V. They are proportional to 1, uh, as it is also in loop quantum cosmology. Okay. So let us uh, proceed then. So we now take these variables and go to the next slide, slide number nine. On slide number nine, we study now the consequences uh, of symmetry. So these phase space functions that vanish in a free, spatially flat Friedman Robertson Walker model. In particular, we're going to look at a three torus because there uh, things are easier and many of the usual complications are not present. So from the last slide, we recall that beta p beta gamma and p gamma are all vanishing. And also we know that the off-diagonal components of p are vanishing in uh, the friedman robertson walker model. Now, what we need to do now is we need to find a first-class subset of these constraints because we want to impose them at the quantum level as strong operator equations, so in a Dirac-type quantization. Then we can't have second-class constraints, and obviously in the first set, for example, beta p beta is second-class, so we can impose beta and p beta at the same time. So therefore, we choose the following first-class subset. We choose beta and gamma equal to zero. And we choose all spatial diffeomorphisms acting on alpha p alpha and phi p phi, where phi p phi is just the matter content of our theory. Now, how do you obtain those spatial diffeomorphisms? You obtain them from this condition p a not b equal to zero. So this is not so obvious on this slide, but what you have to do is you have to take a p a not b. Remember that you solved it by solving the spatial diffeomorphism constraint and you have to check how this solution acts on your reduced phase space, how it acts on the gauge cut. And then you find that it will act by, by spatial diffeomorphisms. Uh, yeah, that's, that's uh, what you find. You can roughly imagine this happening if you uh, imagine that uh, the spatial diffeomorphism constraint is linear in the momentum, so therefore you just take some part of the momentum on the one side of the equation, some the rest on the other, and what you put on the other side, it will roughly correspond again to a spatial diffeomorphism constraint if you look at the details. Uh, you get it exactly. Now there are some terms we have discarded in the spatial diffeomorphisms. There are some terms proportional to beta and gamma, but of course we can discard them because we can kind of superpose our constraints from the first box. So with uh, these constraints in mind, uh, let us uh, uh, continue to the next slide, slide number 10. Now on slide number 10, we quantize our theory and we quantize it as said without imposing any symmetry for now. If you look at the variables that we constructed before, then you find that they are actually looking like scalar fields. So, for example, p alpha, it was a scalar, and it's, a dense, it's conjugate alpha, then you consider as the momentum to the scalar field, and the same you can do with the beta and gamma sector, and the same you can do also with your matter sector, which is this field phi. 
So therefore, we just follow what people usually do in loop quantum gravity to quantize scalar fields. If you can, for example, look in quantum spin dynamics 5 of Thomas Thiemann. And what you do there is you construct, first of all, point holonomies. So point holonomy is just the analog of a holonomy, uh, whereas the thing that you exponentiate is not integrated along some curve, but it's taken at a single point here, the point sigma. So we take p alpha at the point sigma, we exponentiate it, and we multiply it by minus i times rho alpha. Rho alpha here is the representation label. It can be taken in the real numbers. And the group that we are using here, therefore, is the Bohr compactification of the real line. So from this, you kind of construct your kinematical scalar product now. If you have two very simple quantum states, which just correspond to a single point holonomy, then their kinematical scalar product is given by two Kronecker deltas, first a Kronecker delta in the spatial point where they are constructed, and then a Kronecker delta in the representation labels. So this is very similar to the SU2 scalar product, where you have a delta in the a curve along which you integrate, and a delta in the J's. So then, on this Hilbert space, these point holonomies, they act by multiplication as usual, and then we just need to represent their conjugate momenta. So the conjugate momentum alpha, it is a density, so you integrate it along some three-dimensional region R, and you make an operator out of this, you just follow our standard regularization procedures, and you find that on this state H, uh, sigma with rho alpha, it acts by multiplication of rho alpha. Of course, only if uh, the point sigma is contained in the region uh, over which we integrate, it is zero otherwise. So we can repeat this construction now for all the other three sectors, for beta, gamma, and phi. And so you just have then four copies of this scalar field. So now we want to impose our reduction. So from the last slide, we remember that we wanted to impose beta and gamma equal to zero. Here in operator language, this just corresponds to having beta for arbitrary region R and gamma for arbitrary region R vanishing. So if you look how this operates on our cylindrical function, it just tells us that there should be no dependence on p beta or p gamma in our cylindrical functions. Equivalently, all representation labels in the sectors are zero. The second thing that you implement is diffeomorphism invariance. So you just uh, do that again by the standard techniques. Here we just consider the simplest case, which will in fact be enough for this talk. So in the second box, in the first equality, you look at the right hand side. So there is a quantum state which has two point holonomies, one in p alpha, uh, with representation label rho alpha, and one in phi with representation label rho phi. And you just take such a state, you insert it in the rigging map, which constructs the diffeomorphism in varying states, and what you get is just a sum over all points in sigma of this uh, point holonomies. And this you call the diffeomorphism invariant uh, state h diff with representation labels rho alpha, rho phi. Again here I will skip technicalities like that this is a state in the dual space and so forth. So from the rigging map construction, you also obtain a new scalar product for these diffeomorphism invariant states. Uh, it is just given by a Kronecker delta in rho alpha and a Kronecker delta in rho phi. So we see that all the dependence of the spatial point sigma that we used before drops in these diffeomorphism invariant states. So there are just two quantum numbers encoded in them, one quantum number for the matter sector and one quantum number for the geometry sector. Sorry, could you briefly remind me what uh, phi is? The phi, the phi is, the, uh, is the matter field. So in addition to the geometry, we have a canonical pair of a scalar field phi and its momentum, which we call p phi in this talk. Okay. So, uh, so p alpha geometrically was a scalar, and phi geometrically also is a scalar, so we construct the point holonomies from the scalars and not from their uh, momenta, which are densities. Okay. Okay. So let us move then to the next slide, number 11, where we look at reduced operators. So the first set of reduced operators are diagonal operators in the first box. So we can just take alpha and integrate it over all of the spatial slice, so over all of sigma. And uh, we find this obviously acts again by multiplication of rho alpha. And it is also obviously diffeomorphism invariant because uh, sigma is preserved by a diffeomorphism. The th uh, same thing works for the momentum of the scalar field p phi. You integrate it over sigma and it multiplies the state by rho phi. So this was simple, so let's look at another operator that we need, and this is a so-called polymerized shift operator. So we now want to construct an operator which corresponds to p alpha. Now p alpha, we know, cannot exist as an operator on the Hilbert space because our scalar product is not strongly continuous. So what we have to do is we have to 
approximate p-alpha by holonomies, here point holonomies. So this can be done in a standard fashion if you know loop quantum cosmology literature. So you can, can just take the sign of p-alpha with some representation label lambda and then divide by 1 over lambda. Now remember that the sign, it can be expressed as uh, e to the minus ix uh, minus, e to the, uh, minus e to the plus ix divided by 2i, so in terms of two point holonomies. So then also what you need to do, uh, you need to kind of uh, densitize this in order to integrate it over sigma, so you put an alpha to the right of this p-alpha, you integrate everything over sigma, and then you can make an operator out of this by just following our standard uh, construction procedures for such operators. So how does it act now on a diff invariant state? It uh, acts as depicted in this second box. So first the alpha will multiply the state by rho alpha, and then the p alpha will come, uh, you approximated it by two point holonomies, the first one will shift rho alpha by minus lambda, the second one will shift rho alpha by plus lambda, and you will get the additional 1 over 2i, which you got from writing this sign as uh, holonomies. So from this construction, there's one important thing that we observe here, which is that this lambda that we put in this point holonomy to polymerize p, it acts as a cutoff for p alpha. So sine of p alpha, or sine of lambda p alpha, measures lambda p alpha kind of faithfully only if uh, this lambda p alpha is uh, kind of at the order of 1. If it becomes too big, then the sine oscillates and we lose information. So we can now check what this cutoff corresponds to, and if you look at uh, the spatially flat friedman robertson walker model, then you find that the matter energy density scales as a p alpha squared. So what you're doing by setting this cutoff lambda at somewhat at the order of 1 is that you're cutting off this operator once the matter energy density reaches Planck density. So this is of course physically acceptable because we anyway expect that strange things happen at the Planck scale, so this is kind of a valid uh, regularization of this operator. Okay. So as a side remark, this value of lambda or kind of a uh, precise value of lambda can, inferred by, can be inferred by some reasoning which people have done in loop quantum uh, cosmology, in particular the mu bar scheme, uh, and we will refer to that uh, later on. So let us continue then uh, to the next slide, slide number 12. So here on slide number 12 we study the quantum dynamics and we're going to do this in two steps. The first step will be that we look at the Friedman-Robertson-Walker part of the Hamiltonian or Hamiltonian constraint. What this means is that we just look at the terms in the Hamiltonian constraint which we retain when we reduce to Friedman-Robertson-Walker. In the second step, we will look at the other terms, and our strategy will be then to extract the dynamics from the Friedman Robertson Walker part and show that the other terms vanish uh, on our reduced states. So, we can now just take these operators that you found on the previous slide uh, and go through uh, a regularization procedure of this Friedman Robertson Walker part, and what you find is the first box. So, you get. Sorry, so yeah. these operators are not Dirac observable. They are not Dirac observables with respect to the Hamiltonian constraint, uh -huh. so uh, but as they're written here, they are, they are observables with respect to the uh, reduction constraints. So we will, we will solve the Hamiltonian constraint, uh, well, not explicitly here, but it can be solved explicitly with the loop quantum cosmology methods. It will be somehow equivalent to doing this. Um, no, we will, in a second step, we will solve the dynamics. The dynamics, we will just define the dynamics right now. So this is kind of the constraint equation in the first box. And solving it will be a second step. Okay. So you go through a usual regularization procedure and you find the first box. So we have a p phi squared, which we know from the, uh, there should be this p phi squared in the matter sector. And this, uh, the right hand side, it comes from the kind of uh, p squared q squared uh, sector of the Hamiltonian constraint. Now you can of course compute how these uh, uh, operators act in the first box. However, it's uh, more convenient to just rescale variables a little, uh, just with factors at the order of 1. And if you do that and change notation slightly, then you will arrive exactly uh, at the second box, uh, which uh, is uh, identified as a loop quantum cosmology difference equation in V, B variables. So this V is a slight rescaling of the integral of alpha over the slice, and B is a P alpha. So these uh, shifts that you see in the right-hand side, they're generated by this shift operator, and the, the left-hand side by this uh, p-phi. 
So uh, you can then just uh, take this equation and solve it now. You can just uh, copy the solution from the Lupin cosmology papers because what you have shown here is that you're really the dynamics on the state that you used, it reduces to the dynamics that you find at Lupin cosmology. And you can copy all the technical steps that are necessary for solving this equation. Since you can just copy them, I will not comment on them in detail in this paper. I'm just mentioning here there are some certain regularization ambiguities that you encounter in the full theory and that you also encounter in loop quantum cosmology. And if you want to obtain exactly the same equation as in loop quantum cosmology, then you obviously have to choose the same factor ordering in the full theory and reduced theory, which is, is just a, a slight a side comment. It's not really important for the main part here. Okay. So all other terms exactly vanishes? All other terms exactly vanish for suitable regularization that we discuss on the next slide. Yeah. Okay. okay. So let us go to the next slide then, slide number 13, where we just briefly mention that the other terms vanish. So the strategy uh, that you follow is now you just uh, take your regularization and you uh, adapt it in such a way that all other terms vanish. So the other terms that you find, they are terms which come from the Hamiltonian, which are proportional to PAB, but they're not uh, already included in P alpha, where P alpha was a, was a trace of PAB. Now these terms, they are proportional to beta or gamma, because beta or gamma were encoding these terms, and we have said that beta and gamma vanish on our reduced states, so we can just choose an ordering where beta and gamma are sufficiently far to the right, so that these additional terms vanish on the reduced states. The other things that we encounter are spatial derivatives. Now here you have to be a little more uh, careful, so a spatial derivative you would usually regularize as some kind of finite difference. Uh, because our quantum states, roughly, they correspond uh, roughly to lattices. Now, we have to do it in such a way that uh, your regularization is still sufficiently plausible, so you just can't regularize your derivatives such that, such that they always vanish, but you should regularize them in such a way that if you take more complicated states or look at the full theory dynamics or, more, or full state dynamics of the Hamiltonian, that they do not vanish in general. So this can be done if you construct a quantization uh, as was done in the algebraic quantum field theory framework. So if you work on a fixed underlying graph, uh, as uh, was done in this framework by Thiemann and Giesel, uh, then you would just uh, regularize the derivative by some finite difference uh, equation with neighboring vertices. And then if you consider this single vertex state that we have here, then this just corresponds to just taking one, one vertex on your state. Since you're working on this three torus, uh, the single vertex is its own neighbor. So all these terms, they kind of reduce to equations of the type one minus one, uh, and then they vanish. So we have to really say on this slide, so this regularization that was constructed, so in the paper that was published, it is only sketched how to uh, construct this. We uh, not all the details are written, uh, just because it's plausible that when, when you follow these steps as outlined here, then they vanish. It's also plausible physically because we wanted by our reduction to get rid of those terms, so it makes sense that these terms vanish uh, when uh, you act on these reduced quantum states. Okay. So uh, let us continue then. So this was it, what I wanted to say about uh, this uh, first part of the talk. And we uh, continue now with the second part, which will be about the Mu-Bar scheme and the full theory. Uh, page 14 has th uh, this outline. And uh, we now go to page number 15 to start. Now here, our aim will be to reduce to a Bianchi 1 model. So we have to... Uh, do our classical pre preparation slightly differently. So we again start with the ADM phase space. We have Q and P, they are conjugate. We again impose the diagonal metric gauge. That means we are working on this gauge cut between the red and blue surface. On this gauge cut, we have variables QAA and PBB, so only their diagonal components, and they are canonically conjugate. Now these variables Q, uh, A, A, and P, B, B, they are not uh, very useful for this Bianchi 1 reduction, therefore we again construct new variables. The new variables here are called K and E, capital K and capital E, and they are supposed to look roughly like the variables uh, uh, which we have in loop quantum gravity, so roughly like the Ashtekababira variables. So in order to construct them, you do the following. You take uh, individually each component of the metric, for example, Q, X, X, and you write it as E, X, E, X. So you construct this E, which you can imagine as a co-triad, but you construct a single co-triad for every uh, uh, diagonal entry of the metric. Therefore, this E does not have any group indices, it just is a real number. So this E lower, uh, e lower A, you can make an E upper A by inverting it, 
and then you can construct the capital E, which is now a densitized version of this uh, E upper A, and it corresponds to the densitized tribe that we have in loop quantum gravity. The difference is again that it does not carry an SU2 index, it just carries the tensor index A. So conjugate to this E you have K, and K is just uh, constructed by taking the extrinsic curvature and constructing it with uh, the, uh, this triad analog E. And then we see that, well, if you would now add, for example, some sort of spin connection to gamma, then you would get the usual connection that you use. However, here it's not necessary to add any type of spin connection. So with these variables, let us then continue to the next slide, uh, slide number 16. So here we discuss uh, the reduction constraints that we want to impose later. So certainly we know that uh, on a t this, for this Bianchi 1 model we can impose that the spatial derivatives of E and K vanish because in some suitable choice of coordinates E and K they are just conjugate on your or they are just constant on your spatial slice. Again, we impose that the off-diagonal components of P vanish. So the constraints that you now extract from this first class subset are the following. You again extract spatial diffeomorphisms, uh, spatial diffeomorphisms acting on E and K and the matter sector P phi and phi. You again get them from this P A naught D equal to zero condition. Uh, here you have to be a little more careful than before because uh, due to the slight non-geometricity of the construction of E and K, uh, there you don't get all the terms uh, in this constraint, but you have to add uh, some uh, of the other constraints, uh, derivative of E and derivative of K. But then you can superpose them and you get these spatial diffeomorphisms as written here. Also, commuting with this, you get an abelian Gauss law, so derivative or divergence of E equal to zero, and this uh, makes K transform as a connection. So K will uh, transform as an abelian connection, and E will be left uh, invariant by this Gauss law. So therefore, these variables that we have here, they're really like the variables of Maxwell theory. So they're connection variables, but they're abelian. Okay. So, uh, with these variables and these reduction constraints, let us continue to the next slide, uh, slide number 17, where we discuss uh, the uh, uh, reduction in quantum kinematics now. So again, we just perform a standard loop quantum gravity quantization, this time with a Beelian gauge group. Uh, if you want to look at an early account of this in the literature, you can, for example, look at a 97 paper of Kurichi and Krasnov, where this is done for gauge group U1 and brought in the context of charge quantization for Maxwell theory. So what you do there is you just construct holonomies uh, of uh, the integral of k along some curve gamma. Uh, you exponentiate this, uh, multiply it with some representation label rho, and then this is your holonomy. You don't need any path ordering here because you're abelian. Uh, things are simpler in the abelian case. So then you also construct fluxes. You take E, or the dual of E, and you smear it over some surface S. And uh, this is your flux. Since you're abelian, uh, the flux does not carry any group index. So then your Hilbert space is just the same as usual. Uh, it's uh, synonymical functions depending on holonomies. Uh, your scalar product is given by the, uh, or induced by the ashley Lewandowski measure and so forth. So now uh, we want to impose our reduction constraints on this Hilbert space. And the reduction constraints now read that we should impose gauge and spatial diffeomorphism invariance. Now while imposing gauge and spatial diffeomorphism invariance in standard loop quantum gravity is done by kind of constraints that you have to impose. Here it is a reduction step. So at the classical level already we impose spatial diffeomorphism constraint by gauge fixing it. Here imposing it again on this gauge cut is a reduction step that we impose additionally on the theory. So what you then obtain, I mean we of course all know how to implement those constraints. Gauge invariance just means that we con should consider closed Wilson loops and spatial diffeomorphism invariance means that we should spatially diffeomorphism average in the standard way. So again, the easiest state that you can construct will be sufficient for the purpose of this talk. We will again call it a single vertex state. So you construct it as in the box on the right hand side. So this box depicts the three torus, which is our spatial slice. So the three torus topology means that opposing sides of this cube are identified. So therefore, if you look at the black holonomy in row X, which is just a holonomy uh, uh, along some curve gamma x and x direction. It starts uh, on one side of this box, it ends on the other side, but since these sides are identified topologically, uh, this black holonomy is actually closed. So therefore it is a gauge invariant. Now we can construct another holonomy in y direction, the blue one, and one in uh, z direction, the red one, and then you have this state which we call a single vertex state. 
Now, if you spatially diffeomorphism average this state, then uh, the rigging map will delete all information about these curves except for the fact along which direction of the torus they want they run. Because the diffeomorphism cannot take a holonomy running in x direction and make it a holonomy running along y direction, because for this it would need to cut it and uh, glue it uh, again somewhere. So therefore, uh, the information that these uh, states carry, it's kind of the topological information in which direction the holonomy runs and the uh, representation label. So therefore, we just write the state as rho x, rho y, and rho z, and we can now compare this state to what people use in loop quantum cosmology. So there, this state directly translates to the state that people call P1, P2, P3, for example, in this paper by Ashikar and Wilson Ewing. So in order to see that this interpretation is warranted, we need to study how operators act on this state, and we can just study reduced operators. Now it turns out that the areas of the two or sub two tori of this three torus, they are uh, gauge invariant operators, so they commute with the reduction constraints. So for example, the area T2x, it's the area of the two torus which is orthogonal to the x direction, so to the black holonomy. Uh, this uh, area is, I mean, it's topologically a three torus, a two torus, so it is uh, closed. Uh, and uh, if you draw it in this uh, uh, picture, you will see that this black line intersects this uh, area exactly once. The area operator here is just the flux, uh, so due to this uh, one intersection, we get that the area just operates by multiplying with rho x. Now also, the area operators in loop quantum cosmology, they operate by multiplying with p1, p2, and p3, so therefore, this interpretation is warranted that we just map the quantum numbers rho x to p1 and so forth. Now, there are also additional operators. I mean, these uh, operators corresponding to re these reduced Wilson loops, but they are not really uh, important uh, for now, so we will not uh, say much more about them right now on this slide. OK, so now with the uh, having defined the quantum kinematics, we're now going to look at the quantum dynamics on the next slide, uh, slide number 18. So here we are just proceeding as before, we are just uh, taking the Hamiltonian, we regularize it on our reduced states, we split it into a part which yields the Bianchi-1 Hamiltonian and one part uh, which vanishes later in a proper regularization. And here we're just going to focus on uh, one uh, single thing, which is on how in this regularization we polymerize a K, or integrals of K. Now note again, K is the connection, so we can't have operators according or corresponding to K because the scalar product is not strongly continuous. Uh, so, so therefore we have to uh, therefore we have to write them as uh, holonomies and appro or approximate them by holonomies. So in particular here k is not a kind of a point holonomy as before but we have to integrate it along some curve. So therefore what we uh, approximate as a sign is the integral of k along some curve. We again put this lambda there and divide by lambda. So uh, the point is now that these curves that we use, they are very large curves. They are spanning the whole universe. Uh, so uh, we have to check uh, how this will, will look like later on. But essentially, we can make uh, two kind of classes of choices here. So the first one is the U1 choice. So U1 means the following. It means that the gauge group that we actually want our full theory to, cor to correspond to is U1. We have left that uh, kind of uh, open on the last slide. We just uh, kind of said that we have these representation labels row. But if we want uh, these representation labels to be restricted to integers, then we choose U1. And U1 has integer representations. So therefore, the best approximation in this polymerization that we can choose if we take U1 as our gauge group is to set lambda equal to 1. Now, if you set lambda equal to 1 and you go through the regularization, then you will find that on your reduced states, you obtain the old loop quantum cosmology dynamics, and old referring here to the paper from 2003 by Ashtika, Bojewald, and Lewandowski. So there's just a slight remark here because this has led to a confusion earlier. So in this paper from 2003, the theory has been formulated using the Borg compactification as a group. However, uh, the statement here is that if you use U1 in the full theory, then you will arrive at the dynamics that was defined in that paper. And uh, you can, I mean, this uh, kind of makes sense because the dynamics defined in that paper can also be constructed if uh, this would be formulated using uh, U1 and not R Borg. The second uh, class of choice is now uh, to use the Borg compactification as a gauge group. Now, if you use the Borg compactification of the real line, then uh, you can take lambda to be an arbitrary real number. 
If you uh, allow lambda to be an arbitrary real number, then in particular you can implement the so-called new loop quantum cosmology dynamics. And the new loop quantum cosmology dynamics, in the case of Bianchi 1, they correspond to setting 1 over lambda x to be the size of the universe in x direction and similar for uh, the y and z directions. So here it is not immediate that you arrive at the new loop quantum cosmology dynamics, but you have to make this precise choice in the regularization. Now we will see in the next slide that this actually makes a lot of sense from a full theory point of view too to choose this regularization. So let's look at the next box therefore, uh, which uh, has some uh, lessons for the full theory. So the first thing that we observe is that the theory that we constructed here actually looks rather like loop quantum gravity on a fixed graph, for example in the algebraic quantum gravity framework. Uh, uh, and in particular, it looks like we would use the case of a U1 gauge group. Because uh, in loop quantum gravity, our gauge group is SU2. And SU2 has this uh, distinct feature that the representation labels are discrete. You have half integers, which here corresponds to taking uh, the gauge group U1, which corresponds to integer representation labels. So therefore, making the analogy from what we have found here, you would expect problems for very coarse states in the full theory if you act with your fundamental dynamics that we have defined here on these coarse states. And the reason why you would intuitively expect such problems uh, is the following. So if you look at these integrals of k uh, in uh, Friedman-Robertson-Walker model, uh, then you find that they scale as uh, the square root of rho phi, where rho phi here is the matter energy density. So they scale as the square root of the matter energy density times distance. So therefore, these integrals of k, they can become large even if the matter energy density is very small, just if your universe is large enough. And therefore, this uh, regularization to, be, to, uh, to take lambda equal to 1 is actually not a good idea in, in the full theory because it's a kind of very poor approximation for your, uh, for your integrated connection. So therefore, uh, from, a, from this point of view, this uh, Mubarski makes a lot of sense because uh, it just erases the time's distance from this integral. So therefore, the approximation only becomes bad if you reach the Planck regime, which is physically, of course, acceptable. So there you can see some related comments in a recent paper by Charles and, and Levin, which also uh, uh, look at this more from a point of view of the immersive parameter. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that the full theory is not working or, or cannot work. Just because uh, we have kind of what we did here is we said that if we act using some fundamentally defined dynamics on very core states, then we see problems here. So of course, in the full theory, the mu bar dynamics can or could arise if we take the fundamental dynamics, act on a very fine state, and then study the behavior of kind of the coarse observable of its total volume. This, of course, might be different if, as if we act with the fundamental dynamics on the very core state. And there's some promising work about that. There's, of course, the original derivation of the Mubar scheme in AQC, where the Mubar scheme was actually derived from such coarse graining ideas, and then also more recent work from a group field theory condensates or uh, work for by uh, Alicia and Chanfani. Okay. So that is uh, uh, it, what I wanted to say about the uh, Bianchi 1 model. So let us uh, proceed then to the next slide, slide number uh, 19, where we see that we uh, switch gears now and we want to study spherical symmetry now. So let's switch again to slide number 20. So here we perform the classical preparations uh, to study a reduction to uh, spherical symmetry. So uh, we need to choose a different gauge now because the problem is kind of different, so it makes sense to choose different adapted variables. So the uh, gauge that we will choose here is a so called radial gauge. And uh, we will say what this gauge is, but first uh, let me tell you about some other construction which was uh, performed uh, by Duch, Kaminski, Lewandowski, and Szczesewski, uh, uh, which is essentially a construction of observables using Gaussian normal coordinates. So we can look, look, now look at the picture on the upper left-hand side. Uh, there we see our spatial slice sigma, and on the spatial slice we define uh, some physical coordinate system. So we have some observer sigma zero uh, sitting in the center, and uh, this observer defines coordinates by shooting out spatial geodesics. They, he shoots them out at some angles uh, theta and phi, and he shoots them out with some uh, geodesic distance r. And these th and then define a physical coordinate system. And these are just uh, Gaussian normal coordinates. So in these coordinates, you can, for example, define 
spheres of constant geodesic distance from this observer, and we will just call them S2R. Now you can look in your spatial metric if you uh, define, the, or if you look at the, the spatial metric in this adapted coordinates, it will have the form which is below. QAB is given by 100 zero zero in the first line, and then two other zeros, and the non-trivial entries are this Q capital AB. So capital AB here will just run over these angular indices theta and phi. So QA, capital AB is nothing else than the metric on the spheres of constant uh, geodesic distance from the observer. So now an analogous construction of such a construction of observables is given by just imposing a gauge, which just imposes this form of the metric, and this was done in this uh, second paper. And when you have that gauge, you can now uh, go to your gauge cut and do all, all the stuff that you do in order to arrive there. Here we will not say too much about this. We will just say that first we need to choose again adapted connection variables since we want to use uh, AQG methods. And here we have a rather easy uh, time because, well, we look at QAB. QAB or Q capital AB is just a 2 by 2 metric. So we can just look at 2 plus 1 gravity and we can take connection variables which people know how to construct in 2 plus 1 gravity. So these are SU2 connection variables. We here call them capital A and capital E. Uh, they have these indices ij, which are SU2 indices, and the indices capital A and capital B. They are these tensor indices which run only over the spatial, over, over these angular directions, so they have only two values. So therefore they are not kind of full Ashley-Kababero variables, but they are kind of Ashley-Kababero variables in these uh, angular directions. So then also, as before, we need to solve our spatial diffeomorphism constraint, and here we solve it for the components P, R, a, so PRR, the P radial radial, and the P radial angular. And uh, this will then give us some expression in terms of this capital A and capital E. So then again, you study uh, uh, reduction constraints, so you look at some suitable functions which vanish in the symmetry-reduced sector of phase space, and uh, you easily identify that PRA, so P radial angular, should vanish there. Now, uh, when it vanishes, you again find that this corresponds to spatial diffeomorphisms acting on the gauge cut or on this uh, reduced phase space. And these are in particular spatial diffeomorphisms preserving the spheres of constant geodesic distance. So all the vector fields that are constructed in the spatial diffeomorphisms, they are uh, purely in angular direction. So the, the fact that you get these spatial diffeomorphisms, it was uh, already observed in this original paper by Duch, Kaminski, Lewandowski, and Czerzewski. Uh, they are not through a gauge fixing by there, but then uh, through some direct computations of how these PRAs, constructed as kind of real observables with respect to the spatial diffeomorphism constraint, uh, and uh, so, so they were constructed as these observables, and then uh, the uh, Poisson algebra of these observables was computed, and there it was seen that they really generate these uh, spatial diffeomorphisms. Okay. And these spatial diffeomorphisms, again, they are not some gauge, or they are not reducing gauge, but they are reducing physical degrees of freedom. In particular, these are kind of diffeomorphisms with respect to a physical coordinate system defined by this observer, to this physical r theta phi coordinate system. Okay, so with this in mind, uh, let's continue to the next slide, slide number 21. So here we define the quantum kinematics, uh, and then later do the reduction. So again, we do a standard loop quantum gravity quantization. So here it will be even more standard because our gauge group is SU2, so we get our usual spin networks and so forth. The slight difference is the following, that you have to look at your spatial slice in this picture in the middle. It's depicted on the left-hand side. Sigma is then split into or, or foliated by these spheres of constant uh, geodesic distance from the central point. So since your connection only had uh, angular tensor indices, also, the holonomies will run only along angular directions, which means that all of your spin networks, they will actually lie in some sphere of constant geodesic distance. So you can have multiple of those spin networks in a single uh, synonymical function, but all spin networks will be kind of uh, approximating the quantum geometry of these spheres now. So therefore, the kinematics is just, we have AQG, however, the spin networks, they are embedded in these spheres of constant geodesic distance from the center. The reduction is now to impose uh, diffeomorphism invariance again. Of course, we know how to do that. If you look at the diffeomorphisms that we have, they, uh, we can kind of uh, compose them in such a way that we kind of get an individual spatial diffeomorphism average over each of those spheres. 
So therefore, on each of these spheres, this uh, spin network is just uh, diffeomorphism averaged in the usual way. So on these states, you can now construct operators, which are uh, kind of preserved by your sym symmetry constraints or reduction constraints. And these are easy to construct. Uh, it's, for example, the area of one of those spheres of constant geodesic distance. Uh, you just construct it by taking the, well, the metric density and integrating it over the sphere. And you can also construct uh, what people call PR in spherical symmetry, which is just the momentum to this capital R of R. And this you get by integrating the trace of P over uh, the sphere. So you now have your operators, or you, or you have your classical expressions R and, and PR, your kind of reduced expressions in terms of full theory variables. What you can do now is you can just study how they evolve uh, under dynamics. Now this is of course more complicated in this case because our gauge group is SU2 and uh, we have the usual complications that we have in the full theory being that the dynamics is rather uh, involved to compute if you use the full Hamiltonian. So, so far, uh, we, or what we have been doing so far, I will tell you about on the next slide. So let's go to slide number 22 now. So the aim that we had here uh, in a paper that was published last week uh, in collaboration with Antonia Zipfel was to compute the commutator of R and PR uh, as seen by full theory variables. So this is interesting for the following reason. Uh, I mean, if you get the kind of the algebraic relations in your a reduced theory right, then you're kind of rather close to getting also the kind of the dynamics right, uh, the symmetric dynamics, because you can uh, try to approximate then your Hamiltonian by these symmetric operators plus correction terms, which again vanish in your symmetric subspace. So we then uh, set out to do this uh, computation. So uh, in order to do it, you first have to apply certain Poisson bracket tricks. Uh, they are kind of similar as the ones in standard theory. However, they are specific for kind of 2 plus 1 gravity because these spheres on which you're working they're like 2 plus 1 gravity so therefore you can also look in quantum spin dynamics 4 which uh, treats this case. So the formulas in the first box they're not really important uh, to, or they're not important at all to remember they're just to illustrate some points so this R you construct it from a volume operator so the volume operator over which com computes the volume of uh, these spheres of constant geodesic distance in this case, it's slightly different because it is the 2 plus 1 volume operator, which has some slightly different properties than the 3 plus 1 volume operator, but still it is uh, rather involved to compute. So then you also need to construct PR, and PR you can get from a commutator of uh, Hamiltonian with the volume, like uh, we do in the standard uh, case. However, here this Hamiltonian is the Hamiltonian of 2 plus 1 gravity, written in the second line, so it's just the curvature constructed with some normal ni and this epsilon symbol. This ni is just some internal normal which is orthogonal on your uh, tetrads. So now you can just uh, take these operators, go through your usual regularization procedure and see how they act on your states. Now of course this will be rather very difficult, so you want to start with kind of the simplest thing that you can do. So then you think what is the simplest spin network that I can write down on one of these spheres and you might think well it's some uh, construction of trivial and vertices, uh, some pyramid or so, however in the case that we're considering here, which is very similar to 2 plus 1 gravity, there is even a simpler choice. And the simplest choice that you can make is this king state on the right. So the king state, it's a single, single Wilson loop with representation label J, which has exactly one kink. So the kink is where this loop is continuous but not differentiable. On this kink, the 2 plus 1 volume operator is non-trivial. In particular, it acts and does not vanish. On all, all the other points, it vanishes. So therefore, uh, the operators that we construct, they will only act on this kink later. Now we also want our operators to preserve this type of state uh, so that it doesn't kind of destroy the class of states that we have. In particular, we don't want it to add any more loops to this uh, kink state. So therefore, we choose a graph preserving regularization. So this is important for regularizing this Hamiltonian because it has this uh, FAB in it and this will uh, add some loop and we want this loop to coincide with the loop that we already have. And then in order to uh, do this computation here, uh, well, you should probably use some graphical calculus developed by uh, Alessi, Ligner, and Zipfel. And in particular, you need a very able co-author which is uh, able to do these computations. But if you have that, then uh, you're lucky and you can go to the next slide, which is slide number 23. So here we uh, show the results of the computation that was done. And first, we need to kind of think what we even want to compare. 
So you look at the first like darker green line. So there we see that uh, this F A or capital F A B it is approximated by uh, uh, two holonomies H alpha A B. This is what we usually do in the full theory. We approximate uh, the curvature by a holonomy running around some closed loop alpha, and then we take minus uh, to the minus one. So you have to do something similar in the reduced theory because in the re reduced theory a PR will become a point holonomy, so we can't have an operator corresponding to PR, so we also have to express PR uh, using such an approximation, and this is just the same one that we did on all the other slides before. But once we have realized that you should kind of, kind of compare these two things, you can now look what you get, and from the classical reduction you get the first line, so if you sandwich this commutator between two states, a rho and rho plus minus lambda, uh, only then it is non-vanishing and it gives you 0.5i, if you do the quantum reduction, uh, if you sandwich it between two states j and j plus minus one half, then you get uh, something r a little similar, so you get roughly 0.1i, and then you get higher order terms in j, or j to the minus one terms. So what we did in the second line is we did a large spin limit, because the result of this computation is some complicated expression involving six j symbols, and if you want to see what it does, you uh, can, for example, take this large spin expansion. So you could now be happy because you see, well, I can identify j with rho, I can identify lambda with one half. This one half that we have in the second line was just because we choose the regularization spin of this uh, f of a beta to be one half, but we could in principle also choose it differently, and then it already looks rather similar what you get. So there are, however, several problems in this computation. So the first one is a strong regularization dependence is observed. So you can also get different results for the quantum reduction. In particular, you can, a different, you can get a different scaling with j at leading order. So in particular, the first regularization that uh, was done, it gave some scaling with j, and then only later uh, there was a regularization which uh, gives this scaling here. So the reason why this uh, strong regularization dependence is observed is that this king state is very degenerate. So in particular, if you look at it, it does not correspond to some proper dual triangulation or so forth. And uh, in particular, the volume operator is very degenerate on this state. So if you uh, look at the volume operator and, and see what it should do, you would expect the volume operator to scale like j squared, because the length in your theory will scale like j, and uh, the volume should scale like j squared. And it does that if you take some more complicated states, for example, trivalent vertex. However, if you act on a two-valent or on this two-valent king state, then the volume only scales as j. So it scales only as the square root of what you expect it to scale with. And this comes from this degeneracy. It comes from uh, certain terms or the leading order terms in the volume operator dropping, uh, since your state is kind of not uh, geometric enough. So therefore, the Poisson bracket tricks that you use in defining these operators, they don't work well anymore, because they, what these tricks do is they, for example, approximate uh, 1 over r by some Poisson bracket, and uh, if uh, you lose the geometric properties uh, of your operators involved there, then things go wrong. So these problems could partially be cured by choosing uh, proper regularization. So you can kind of do the factor ordering exactly in such a way that uh, most of these problems go away, uh, and then you get kind of qualitatively the correct result, as we see in the green box. However, it is still numerically off, and this is, uh, or still quantitatively off, and this is not surprising because we can only uh, correct this uh, qualitatively so far. So the good thing, however, is that these problems, or these degeneracy problems, they are absent if you consider higher valent vertices, for example, the trivalent vertex. Uh, but this has uh, not been looked so far, and we hope to do this in future work. The, compu uh, the complication there is, of course, that the compu computation there is more complicated, uh, because, in particular, this, uh, the, the, the uh, the structure of your state will not really be preserved. So you can choose a graph-preserving regularization. However, then you will have several j's in your full theory state, but you will have just one row in your reduced state, and then you need to do some form of non-trivial cost-graining and so forth. So then everything is more involved. However, the problems that we, observe, that we observed so far, they uh, should go away. Okay. So let us move on then uh, to the conclusion, which is on slide number 25. So we have outlined uh, a strategy for imposing a re uh, reduction to some symmetric sector at the quantum level in loop quantum gravity. A very important ingredient there has been a suitable classical gauge fixing and a suitable choice of quantization variables. We defined uh, these uh, uh, kind of symmetric states and operators in this way shown here. By doing that, we recovered loop quantum cosmology 
uh, including the loop on cosmology dynamics. Here it was important that we used the mu bar scheme when using uh, these connection variables. The mu bar scheme was kind of automatically implemented in these BV type variables, but for the uh, other variables, for these Maxwell variables, we had to really use it. And the reason that we had to use it is that we used uh, or we extracted loop quantum cosmology as a single vertex truncation of the full theory. So this is because it was the easiest starting point and it gives you what you want. However, you could of course also think now how to generalize this result. In particular, you would like to study coarse graining here. So you would like to take your state and uh, make it finer and finer and see how your dynamics uh, kind of change once you do that. The good thing here is that things are easier. So as a lesson for the full theory, or if you want to study more open questions, what you can take away from here is that uh, the methods that we have developed here, they offer a simplified setting where dynamics are easier because they are essentially abelian, and you can uh, study this and also the coarse graining in a simplified setting. Now also we looked at uh, spherical symmetry uh, within these SU2 variables. Here, uh, as said, the results are only partial because the computations are more complicated, uh, but we hope to uh, improve that in the future. So let me thank you very much for your attention. Questions? I have a question. Um, so uh, in all of these cases, you're using a single vertex truncation of the full theory. Is that right? Uh, that is correct, yes. OK. So it seems to me that um, by looking at a, a single vertex truncation, you're, you're basically avoiding the question of, of how to impose um, a, really the uh, spatial symmetries. I mean, spatial symmetries really have to do with relating the variable to different points in space. But when you have only one point of space, um, it, it seems like you're, you're avoiding the, the, the sort of the core issue of, of imposing symmetry. And in fact, this. this, this uh, I, I, would, I would partially, at least partially, disagree with this. So the point is the following: if you, stu if you study the the the, I mean, the Hilbert space that we have constructed, uh, we have chosen a physical coordinate system, and uh, and on this physical coordinate system, you kind of know where a holonomy is. You know where a vertex is because it was defined with by some by some construction. So therefore, if you then impose diffeomorphism invariance, you're imposing this with respect to some predefined physical coordinate system. So you're averaging this away. So your states are really looking like the usual states that you have. However, a reduction has been has been achieved. So for example, if you consider this king state in spherical symmetry, uh, in the symmetry reduced state, this king is kind of at every point of the sphere at the same time. Because your state is a superposition of this king being at every point at the same time, but this point is a physical point. Okay. All right. Then let, let me ask another question, which I think is, 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 is very much related to this. Whenever you mention the symmetry constraints which you impose, it, it seems that you're, you're only imposing that certain, um, uh, certain components of P and Q vanish or are equal to each other. Uh, again, this, is not, this doesn't tell you anything about the relationship between uh, the, the, the variables at different points in space. Is that, is that true? So, like, for example, you, you, how are you imposing homogeneity if you don't have a constraint which is relating the field to different points. I mean, the thing is, imposing diffeomorphism invariance is not the same as imposing homogeneity. Uh, yes, so, so the point is the following. The, these functions f that we choose, they, are, they do not need to be, and in fact, they are not uh, functions which strictly restrict you to uh, your symmetry-reduced sector at the classical level. These functions f are chosen in such a way that you will have an easy time implementing them and that in the end you will be able to extract the dynamics that you're looking for. So the, the, the choice of these functions f, it's kind of uh, pure convenience. And I agree that they are, not, they are not, not enough at the classical level to reduce your symmetry. Uh, however, at the quantum level this might not even be necessary because if you, for example, look at the... I mean, the, the only thing that is necessary in the end that they give you that the, the, the Hilbert space we have left still supports the degrees of freedom that you want to support and that it supports the dynamics that you want to support, and in particular that you can compute something in the end. Um, my only other question had to do with the, the lambda, the cutoff. At the very beginning of the talk, um, you, you gave a justification for this, uh, for, for fixing lambda, saying that, um, that uh, strange things happen at, uh, at the Planck scale, and 
But, but I mean, of course, what ha- the strange things that are happening at, at the Planck scale are exactly what we're interested in in the full theory. Um, so, I mean, in, in loop quantum cosmology, we have a very good motivation for, for fixing a fundamental uh, cutoff. But in the full theory, it's not so clear to me that we have a, a good motivation for fixing a fundamental cutoff. You're just sort of fixing it the way that's necessary to make it fit with LQC. Is that right, or am I missing something? It is, uh, so in this case of the BV variables, or in the case of the lambda of the first part of the talk, this is correct. I mean, I need to write P alpha in terms of point holonomies, so then you do it in this way. This is the simplest way to do it. And uh, it is observed that it, it is physically plausible to set lambda uh, to, uh, at the order of one, because then deviations happen when you reach Planck density. So this is the only thing that goes in uh, for this first part. In the second part, the reason to choose the Mubar scheme is stronger, because there, uh, this holonomy of k, it scales as uh, the, like uh, Planck density times distance. So you really want to get rid of this factor of distance. You cannot take the polymerization scale to be anything else than 1 over distance, because if you do, then uh, well, you do not get your corrections at the Planck scale. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. It is Param here at LSU. So. My question is regarding the Bianchi-1 model in your scheme. Uh, in the literature, there have been two Bianchi-1 models, both based on mu bar scheme. Uh, there was an earlier model which was given by Davi Chow, and then it was developed by Guillermo, uh, Thomas Pelosi, and others, which essentially has the same um, lambda dependence, but it is slightly different from what was given later by Ashtaker and Wilson Ewing. So my question is, like in your scheme, like is there a way that we can understand that uh, out of the, uh, these ambiguities in choosing even which is the correct mu bar scheme in the anisotropic models, which plagues all anisotropic models, can the full theory pick out uh, one of those schemes? Or if we wanted to uh, obtain the mu bar scheme of the earlier Bianchi 1 models, even that will be possible. So unfortunately, I don't know the details of that paper right now. But in general, I can say that it does not seem that there is so far a good justification for choosing one or the other. You have the same regularization ambiguities that you have in the reduced theory, or then also in the full theory, you have even more. Uh, one thing that you could impose is uh, that your Hamiltonian should be, in some sense, anomaly free, or, or your physical Hamiltonian should be anomaly free in the full theory, and it should work also well for very coarse states, in particular non symmetric states. This is, of course, very difficult uh, to realize. I mean, we, we know that. But if you could do such a thing, then and then the Hamiltonian turns out to be unique, then you would know uh, how the LQC Hamiltonian would, uh, should look like. But this is uh, not, I have not looked at this so far. Yeah, but I, I think like that would be really wonderful if, if there can be some hints on uh, how to even fix this uh, ambiguity. My second question is related to this one. So. Uh, you had you didn't discuss some of the mathematical details, but I would like to ask, like in the in your reduction to the Bianchi one, uh, uh, do you have the Hamiltonian constraint which is self-adjoint? Uh, I'm asking this because in the original Ashtaker Wilson Ewing picture, uh, it is still not clear uh, whether it is self-adjoint or not. Uh, I don't know. So the the construction I did does not go beyond reproducing uh, the constraint of of Ashtaker and Wilson Ewing. Okay. Thank you. More questions? Um, yes, I have a more general, maybe more philosophical question. So um, my question is, I understand that you always, uh, I mean, you never really, um, you don't, I mean, you just you produce different, you choose different variables, let's say, by doing different page fixings, which are adapted to the symmetry of the problem, okay? So obviously what you get is still a full theory with all the degrees of freedom. However, depending on the symmetry of the problem, it looks complete, the, the classical variables you choose as fundamental are completely different. Like in the freeman urban worker adapted case, you have point holonomies, and in the, in the, in the symmetric spherical symmetry, you have rather uh, more, um, say polymeric objects. So what are actually the chances that the quantization that you do of this theories are actually equivalent in any sense. Uh, I mean, this is, of course, a good point. Uh, I, of course, don't know to which extent these uh, quantizations are equivalent. However, I think it's better to view this from kind of a different angle. 
So from my point of view, this question of whether these two quantizations are equivalent is not even well defined. I mean, it's really not well defined if you think about it. Because if you, for example, do standard loop quantum gravity, you take your holonomy flux algebra or your SU2 algebra. Now we know that uh, in order to construct, I mean, it's hard to construct uh, some other phase-based functions from these holonomies and fluxes. You can't just extract the connection from the holonomy in some easy way. So therefore, if you would want to relate SU2 variables to, for example, the U1 variables, which are used in the Bianchi 1 case, uh, then in order to even to relate them as operators, you would need to have some... Uh, infinitely complicated uh, expression to do that because uh, I mean it's you just not you just don't map some element of the algebra in one side to the other uh, element in, or to the other algebra so therefore first of all it's infinitely complicated it, there's no guarantee of any convergence or so and then it's highly non-unique because there are a zillion different ways to do that so therefore s s since since you don't specify how kind of the preferred subset of variables which you quantize is related to some other preferred subset at the quantum level, this, qu this question of equivalence of the quantum theories, it does not really make sense in my point of view. So from fr the point of view that I take here is the following, that uh, I mean, there, there are certain things that you're interested in in the quantum theory, for example, the symmetry reduced sector of, of some model, and you should already choose classically the variables such that you can easily extract those uh, those variables. If you choose some non-adapted variables, it might be very hard uh, to uh, extract uh, these the symmetry reduced subsector. But more more, uh, the, the bigger problem is that it's highly non-unique. It's highly non-unique how how you kind of approximate certain phase-based functions which are not in your elementary set of functions which you quantize. Yeah, okay, thank you. Any other question? I'd like to ask again, uh, this is coming back to my question that I had earlier. Um, so I, I'm confused. So are, are you claiming that you're imposing homogeneity, for example, when you are deriving the Bianchi 1 uh, model, or, or are you... I'm not, claiming not, that I, I'm not claiming that I impose homogeneity. I'm claiming that uh, I am imposing phase-based functions which vanish if you are in homogeneity. Right, which are um, necessary but not sufficient conditions for homogeneity classically, right? Yes. Or because because the the, the phase-based functions which are setting equal to zero, and it, the, 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 classically those conditions are not relating the field at different points, so it, I don't see how it can be sufficient to imply homogeneity. Yes, it is. It is not sufficient, but but but, but it is necessary. Uh, however, it is sufficient in the sense that you get what you want in the end. Because you restrict to a single vertex tr truncation. Yes. So you can you can see this single vertex truncation as uh, kind of uh, uh, an addition in that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, actually, yes, I have a question both to Jonathan and you. Like, uh, do you guys think, or maybe Jonathan, do you think like this scheme would not work for uh, models like Bianchi Nine because maybe there, like, the questions that you have will become very relevant. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm I, I haven't. I'm not familiar enough with Bianchi Nine to make a remark off the cuff. Okay, I can only agree with uh, Jonathan. Okay, thank you. More questions? Okay, let's send the speaker again.